behalf of University of Moratua. It's very, very happy uh, to initiate an event, the inaugural lecture series of those uh, professors who are joining to the ranks of professor at the University of Moratua. We starting from uh, this year's January uh, 2021. And it's indeed happy to uh, start the first, the inaugural lecture by Professor Deni Nawagamua today. And um, so welcome uh, all the uh, Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor Priyan Dias, indeed Professor Kulatilaka, Head of the Department of Civil Engineering, and more so the, uh, all those who are joining virtually to this event. And I wish to thank the onset uh, to the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka National Science Foundation uh, for the promotion given for the event and also for the Daily FT uh, for the print media coverage and the Sri Lankan Scientist, the magazine, uh, for the uh, coverage given in the social media and also the Expo Graphics for supporting the small memento for the event that comes to the speaker. And of course, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Udeni Nawagamua, who is our first speaker for the, day, uh, to, uh, the series. And of course, uh, we were expecting the family, to welcome the family, but considering the times, we know that they are joining from uh, virtually to the event. As the first event, uh, we would like to invite uh, Professor Priyan Dias to actually give a flavor of why we should have this inaugural lecture series and to give an introduction to the audience on the importance of this uh, event. So may I kindly invite Professor Priyan Dias. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. So I have asked, uh, been asked to say a few words about this concept of an inaugural lecture. Uh, this is, of course, a new departure for the University of Moratua, for which we must be thankful to the new Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies. But an inaugural lecture is a very old academic tradition. In 1669, Professor Isaac Newton was appointed to the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Trinity College in Cambridge. And he spoke on the topic of colors. Now, Newton, of course, is known very well for his theories of mechanics and gravitation, but we also know from the time we spent in school that he also did work on optics and, uh, and colors. Over 300 years later, Professor Stephen Hawking was appointed to the same Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Trinity College, and he spoke in his inaugural lecture on the topic, Is the End in Sight? for theoretical physics. Uh, when we come to engineering, in fact, to the very field of soil mechanics uh, on which our new professor is going to speak to us this evening, Alex Kempton was appointed to the chair of soil mechanics at Imperial College in 1955, and he spoke on the topic, soil mechanics and its place in the university. And in 2021, Professor Udeni Nawagamua will speak on the topic, nature-based landslide mitigation, a futuristic approach. So uh, to have an inaugural lecture, when the university promotes an inaugural lecture, it is standing in the line of a long tradition. The second thing that I want to say is that, you know, in the early days, the word professor was used uh, rather indiscriminately. In the, in the very early days, anyone who taught was also called a professor. And I think uh, in Italy, we get this same idea because any teacher is called professori. But in the English-speaking world, now there is a very clear distinction between people who are professors and people who are just normal lecturers. So Professor Nawagamua was at one time Dr. Nawagamua. Now, I think there are a few differences between lecturers and professors. The general audience for a lecturer is a group of students. Whereas where a professor is concerned, when the university bestows the title of professor on one of its teachers, it means that that person is ready to face the world and his audience is the, is the public, is the world. Lecturers, when they teach students, 
they generally tell students about established knowledge. It is a dissemination or transmission of established knowledge. But professors are expected to discover new knowledge and be at that cutting edge of knowledge. In lectures, generally what is covered is in the area of facts. It is facts that are transmitted to students. But professors are expected to develop theories and a theory is something like a belief because the word profess is often used in the context of a belief. What I profess, what I believe, the theories I hold. A and we expect of professors that they will hold theories because a theory is something that is held in without regard, without undue regard to everyday experience. Right? So, for example, uh, Nicolaus Copernicus, you know, although every morning like the rest of the people during his time, he saw the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, he was bold enough to say that although this is what things appear to be, actually it is the earth that is going, turning around its axis and the, 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 the earth is going around the sun. And more recently, Sir John Baker, who was Professor of Mechanical Sciences at Cambridge University, was bold enough to say that when we design structures, we should not look at the way that they normally behave, but think about the point of failure, and so gave rise to a whole new theory of, uh, of plastic design. So professors are expected to hold beliefs, to profess those beliefs, and to be able to defend those beliefs in front of the public which I'm sure Professor Nawagamu will do very shortly. Thank you. Yes, to ready to face the public. And uh, the objective being to do more and to be more. Um, it's time to, uh, to get to know this speaker. Uh, that will be done by introduction to the speakers by Professor Kula Tilaka, who is the head of the civil engineer. Very good evening to all of you. The Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Deans of the Faculties of Graduate Studies and Engineering, uh, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, all uh, joining through the uh, internet. It is with great, pre great pressure that I introduce my younger colleague and former student, Professor Udeni Priyantana Gamua, delivering this inaugural lecture upon the appointment to the grade of professor. I'm very happy that Udeni got the opportunity to inaugurate this lecture series at the University of Moratua. Udeni Nawagamua graduated from University of Moratua with an honors degree in civil engineering in 1999. He completed his master's degree at AIT in 2002 and PhD at Yokohama National University, Japan in 2005. He, he became a member of the ISL in January 2008 and currently a fellow. A research paper he submitted based on his final year research project won the competition organized by the Sri Lankan Geotechnical Society for the younger engin young engineers, that is those who are under 35 years of age. There was a stiff competition and he, got the he won the competition and won got the opportunity to represent Sri Lanka in the first International Young Geotechnical Engineers Conference organized by the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering held at Southampton University in the year 2000. Many PhD holders and PhD students from different countries were among the other participants. So the promising start, uh, this promising start was continued, winning many best paper awards at number of events thereafter. Naming, namely, the EOE Pereira Award for the best technical paper presented at IESL annual sessions in 2009 and 2010, and the best paper award for the fourth international during the fourth international symposium in, on advances in civil and environmental engineering practices for sustainable development in March 2016. He has published more than 85 referred papers in journals and conferences. On a number of other occasions, students guided by him have won many paper awards. He had the opportunity to visit many prestigious universities uh, in the world and collaborate in research activities. 
He was a visiting scholar at the University of South Florida, USA in 2009, and a visiting scholar at Vanderbilt University uh, from January to July 2017, and an uh, Endeavour Heat Research Fellow at University of Wollongong, Australia, uh, from August 2017 to February 2018. He's a good very good communicator, a great team man with excellent leadership qualities, who has given leadership to his peers in many situations as an undergraduate student as an po and as a postgraduate student. He continued to be a very good leader upon accomplishment of his academic and professional qualifications. His Specialized training is in the field of geotechnical engineering with research interest in the areas, earth retaining structures, ground improvement techniques, uh, use of domestic and industrial waste in construction, geo-environmental engineering, development of fast and bouncy cricket pitches, landslide studies, and railway geotechnics. As a true academic, he is fully, com fully committed to the creation and dissemination of knowledge. He does that at the university with his students and with, at the National Building Research Organization and extend it to the society at large through many learned societies and professional institutions in the country. He is highly involved in the Sri Lankan Geotechnical Society, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, and the Sri Lankan Association for Advancement of Science. At the Sri Lankan Geotechnical Society, he was a member of the executive committee since 2006 and was the editor of the newsletter from 2006 to 2012, conference secretary in the international conferences held in 2007, 2015, and one to be held in 2021. As a professional engineer, he is making a significant contribution to the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka. He was a council member from 2010 to 2016 and back in the current session from 2019 up to 2021. He is the editor of the SLEN, the newsletter of the Institute of Sri Lanka from 2012 to 2016. And he is a member of the engineering, uh, civil engineering sectional committee in 2007 and 2008. He has also proved that he can work very effectively with the scientist by making a significant contribution through the Sri Lankan Association for Advancement of Science, SLAS. He was a council member of SLAS from 2008, became the president of the Section C in 2010, chairman of the Committee of Popularization of Science in 2012, and he was the general secretary there from 2017 and 2014, and he's a member of the Board of Trustees since 2018. Despite all these services to the society, uh, he's all, all, they are always making a very dedicated con commitment to all department activities, whether it may be a survey camp, accreditation, safety committee, or anything else done in the department. He never says no when his services are needed by the department. This is on top of a very heavy teaching load. He can manage his time very effectively. While fulfilling all these responsibilities, at present, he plays, the, he plays a major role in the university administration as director training, director planning and rehabilitation. He's a very valuable member of the civil engineering family and an example to all our younger colleagues. As the head of the department, I am highly privileged to have the services of a number of young colleagues like him in the department who are intelligent, dedicated, and committed. Knowing that they are, they are around to take the institution to greater heights, we can retire happily in few years. I wish him well and look forward to hear about great achievements in the future. So today, he will be speaking about the uh, nature-based landslide mitigation, a uh, futuristic approach, something very applicable to Sri Lanka. Thank you, and it is over to you, President Agamba. Thank you, sir. 
uh, in fact, uh, when the organizers asked me who is the best person to introduce myself, I said it is none other than Professor Atula Pulatilaka. He was my supervisor and mentor. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Vice Chancellor, sir, Deputy Vice Chancellor, sir, the deans, my colleagues and friends. Uh, it is a great privilege and honor to me to be invited to deliver this inaugural lecture or the professorial lecture and I know at the same time it's a huge responsibility and I hope that I will do the justice. I will be talking today on this topic nature-based landslide mitigation a futuristic approach. So this is a multidisciplinary research that I want to highlight before starting my lecture because when I uh, invited some of my friends, those who are not engineers, they said it is really boring to listen to engineering lectures. I said, no, this is a multidisciplinary, you can listen and evaluate after that. Okay, then I welcome you all for my lecture. This uh, professorial lecture is dedicated to all my teachers, including parents, my first teachers. I quote Mahatma Gandhi, he said, every home is a university and the parents are the teachers, unquote. My research life started with my undergraduate research with Professor Atula Pulatilaka. It was about the study of the behavior of anchored tire retaining structures in 1980, 1998 and 1999 time. And then I did my master's at AIT Thailand. My image research was the cavity expansion analysis on corn penetration resistance and compaction piles. That was on uh, about ground improvement. I did it in 2000-2002 period. And then I started my PhD, Doctor of Engineering at Yokohama National University in Japan that was on studying the effects of influential factors on the consolidation of with vertical drains with the late Professor Goro Imai in 2002-2005 period. And then I had two sabbatical uh, vacations at Vanderbilt University with uh, Professor George Hornberger and at University of Wollongong with uh, distinguished Professor Buddhimindra Ratnam in 2017-18. And as Professor Kulatilaka already in introduced me with my research interest, so those are the research interests that I have, earth retaining structures, ground improvement techniques, used of uh, waste in the geo-construction work, and geo-environmental engineering, development of fast and bouncy cricket pitches, landslide studies, and recently with this railway geotechs. And I will just take you to this slide. This was about the media at the landslide some time back. So it is evident that Sri Lanka has become the hotspot for landslide in the South Asian region. So this is not the end of this landslide issues in this country. You know after that we had Aranayaka. We had some more, but we have to see what we have done. Right? So that's what I thought of talking today with my, this uh, new topic, this uh, nature-based landslide mitigation. The content I am going to cover today will be on the landslides, what is landslides and the different types of landslides, the mitigation measures, the background of the nature-based landslide mitigation methods, the experience that we can get from other countries, the Sri Lankan experience, what we have done in Sri Lanka, and then the opportunities for further studies or future studies and the publications I have done in these subjects and the acknowledgement. What is a landslide? I am quoting from this USGS definition. This is, they say a landslide is defined as the movement of mass of rock or debris or earth down a slope. Landslides are a type of mass wasting which denotes any downslope movement of soil and rock under the direct influence of gravity. Right? The, the key word is the direct influence of gravity. And there are different types of landslides or different factors are there for creating landslides. So landslides can be initiated in slopes already on the verge of movement by rainfall. In Sri Lanka we call uh, rainfall is the triggering factor, snow melt in some countries, changes in water levels, stream erosion, changes in groundwater, earthquakes, volcanic activities in some parts of the world and also because of the 
disturbance by human activities or any combination of these factors. And I would like to show you a few types of landslides that you can see. There are different types of landslides that you can see. If you want to categorize them, you can see uh, rotational, uh, different types of uh, flights like uh, up to uh, creep. The last one is creep, the rock falls, uh, the translational. There are different types of uh, landslides you can see. It's because of their behavior, because of their movement that you can see the type of landslide and real examples that you can see in the uh, nature or the field. And why do we have to study landslides? Now we know our civilization started in the, the north central province or the flat land, relatively flat land. And because of some safety reasons, we moved to the highlands or the hill country. So as people move into new areas of hilly or mountainous terrain, it is important to understand that the nature of their potential exposure to landslide hazards and how cities, towns can plan for land use engineering of new construction and infrastructure, which will reduce the cost of living with landslides. Although the physical causes of many landslides cannot be removed, geologic investigation, good engineering practices, and effective enforcement of land use management regulations can reduce the landslide hazards. It is also important to understand the science of landslides, their causes, movement characteristics, soil properties, the geology associated with them, and where they are likely to occur. And then next question is, do human activities cause landslides? Yes. In some cases, human activities can be a contributing factor for landslides. Many human caused landslides can be avoided or mitigated. That is, we are responsible for that. They are commonly uh, because of a result of building roads and structures without adequate grading of slopes, poorly planned alteration of drainage patterns, or disturbing all landslides or previous landslides. Then FEMA explained how to identify warning signs of landslides. There are changes in the landscape. There can be new cracks in the uh, buildings. The outside uh, parts of the buildings can be moving, that you can see those things, and slowly developing cracks in the ground, and the bulging of the tow area, then water breaks uh, in, in some new locations, fence, retaining walls, or post are tilting, or there may be a faint uh, rumbling sound near to the uh, landslide. When, when landslide nears that there will be a lot of sounds like that. So there are warning signs when you say that there are landslides that is going to happen. And then the triggering factors that could cause landslide or causative factors. We have two processes that we have to understand here. One is some factors will decrease the shear strength or the strength of the soil. Some factors will drive the uh, or increase the uh, stress or the shear stress. So there are two factors here we have to consider, the decreasing in the shear strength that may be due to rainfall or may be due to some construction activities like pile driving or due to some cyclic loading. And the d increase in the driving shear stress may be due to erosion or may be due to surcharging at the top or maybe rapid drawdown in reservoirs or due to some rock falling. And I am introducing this or no, I am just uh, taking this one as a landslide hazard zonation mapping into this, uh, my presentation because this is very important, right? So la in National Building Research Organization has initiated this project for some time now. So they have maps available as one is to 50,000 and one is to 10,000. These are available for landslide hazards uh, areas and now they are moving to 1 is to 10,000 maps. 1 is to 10,000 maps are very important because if you just look at this 1 is to 50,000 map, the 1 millimeter has a large area or oh, how was it? 10 millimeter is quite large area. So, but uh, it may represent a wrong uh, inter information in the map. So because of that, they are now moving to 1 is to 10,000 maps. So these maps are developed after an extensive field studies, evaluation of the site, and 
the other information. So they have six causative factor attributes such as geology, slope, soil overburden, hydrology, landform and the land use patterns in the area. If you see this one, that these are very important maps, right? So this, the green color shows the very less likely uh, land li landslide areas and the r r dark red areas are uh, high potential areas for landslides. And if you talk about the mitigation measures, there are different classifications for mitigation measures. One is called active and passive measures. This active and passive measures, stabilization measures, in relation to whether the mitigation measures actively pursue an improvement of the stability of the slope. E or they passively intercept or run out when movement occurs. So then we have hard and soft stabilization measures. Hard is normally used to describe structural uh, techniques that are visually obvious. We call uh, engineering measures like hard retaining structures like this. And also we have soft uh, mitigation measures that is normally used to describe techniques that are visually less intrusive and which improve the strength of other, the properties of soils. And also we have two other classifications. One is called preventive, the other one is remedial. This stabilization measures relate into the relevance to different stages of the movement. And if you just see the different types of landslide hazard mitigation measures, we can see the surface protection controls or uh, control of surface erosion, and then we can modify the geometry of the slope or the surface, and then modify the surface water regime. Uh, we can introduce surface drainage, and also we have the mo to modify the groundwater regime. We can reduce the water table by pumping out water at deep, uh, deep drainage. And also we can modify the mechanical characteristics of the unstable mass by uh, introducing anchors. And also we can transfer the load to more competent strata and also we can introduce some fences like boulder rock uh, uh, catching nets. And then I am moving to the topic, the nature-based solutions. Now you know about the background of the landslides and also the different mitigation measures. In these nature-based solutions, what we talk about the interventions which make use of natural processes and ecosystem services to address the hazards such as floods, erosion and landslides. I am particularly talking about the landslides. And this can be completely green. And also it means totally eco, uh, consistent of ecosystem elements. So that can be hybrid combination of uh, ecosystem elements and the conventional engineering measures. And also the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction introduce this as an effective and sustainable technique to reduce the disaster risk. I am taking this example from Hong Kong. We, we consider as geotechnical uh, professionals in the world, the Hong Kong has the best manuals, the guidelines, and the procedure against the landslide disasters. So, until 1977, they observed their landslide risk was increasing. But in 1977, they introduced different mechanisms, different structures, and different ways of handling that. And because of these engineering measures, their landslide risks reduced. And in 2010, they again realized our already constructed structures are now deteriorating or degrading. So now, this is a time that we have to think of new phase. That phase is introducing vegetation into this existing structure. So that was the one they did in 2010. Now uh, I will show some things that they have done. So they have developed guidelines for planting on slopes. So for different soil uh, slope angles, they introduce different plant types. So they, but we have to see the soil type as well. But here we can simply say, because of the different angles, they have developed this kind of simple guideline that everybody can follow. Eh, follow this. Anybody can follow this one. And then they introduce these concepts like all are existing structures, but they introduce different landscape layout plans. The vertical creepers, they introduce uh, places for plants and they introduce toe supports with vegetation. And also they introduce these flexible barriers using plants. So then these flexible barriers will protect 
the road structures so uh, the the infrastructure uh, because they can block all these rock falls and other movements of uh, uh, mass for due to landslides and this is kind of a schematic diagram for integrating green nature based solutions uh, into our system so if you have this uh, landslide mapping and then we can see whether with this other information whether we are going to uh, resettle these people that is one of the options we have if you are going to resettle the people of course we can do but if you are going to live with the landslides we have options so that's what i am going to talk that we can live with the landslides so then we have to introduce this kind of mitigation measures so mitigation measures can be green or conventional or hybrid so that's that's the one that we can see as nature based so the green one is nature based so with this other instrumentation and other informations that you can see in the green, blue color ones that we collect the information and then we can go for the uh, solutions so that is the concept that we here present here that is living with landslides and IUCN introduced eight principles of relevance to nature based solutions those are called embrace nature conservation norms and principles and then can be implemented alone or in an integrated manner with other solutions we call hybrid then those are determined by site specific natural and cultural context that can be produce social show, uh, show, uh, societal benefits and also maintain biological and cultural diversity and also apply to landscape scale and recognize and address the trade offs between the products so it is economy and also the most important thing it is an integral part of the overall design policies and actions and we have two things as i already told you this integration of nbas or nature based solutions in landslide risk mitigation and management one is living with existing risk with introduction of appropriate measures to reduce landslide risk or we can see safer land use planning through the measures for reducing the exposure uh, having undertaken various interventions including resettlement right so that is one option right we can introduce resettlement or relocation of vulnerable elements vulnerable elements are the uh, the infrastructure and even the people and now we can see the role of plants in improving slope stability and minimize uh, soil erosion we have two basic concepts one is hydrological advantages the other one is the mechanical advantages in the hydrological advantages this the the tree the the leaves the leaves in the plant that can intercept or that can disturb the rainfall and reduce the impact of the ground right so because of that it will reduce the infiltration in the ground but when you have a lot of trees on the floor in the ground so that can even again uh, block the surface runoff and then there can be more infiltration that is a negative side right so they have positive side as well as negative side so and also the uh, another hydrological impact is that these roots can absorb more water and then because of the evapotranspiration they reduce the moisture in the ground so when they reduce the moisture in the ground they they maintain uh, um, unsaturated situation the soil is stronger and in the other words in the mechanical aspects these roots act as anchors they they provide the tension tensile capacity to the soil but normally the uh, soils are uh, not good in tension right so they are uh, tension capacity is zero right tensile capacity is zero right so because of that these roots can provide that of uh, uh, capacity to the soil and also there are some disadvantages in mechanical aspects as well that is when you have a strong wind that can transfer to the uh, soil so that is that can be a dynamic force to the soil so that can be a danger so there are goods and also bad sides of this uh, uh, vegetation on the stability of the slopes and the i will highlight this uh, benefits of nbs or nature based again in stabilizing slopes 
right? So this plant evapotranspiration mechanism serves as rainfall holders by maintaining the negative power water pressure on the ground. And also, so it will maintain an unsaturated mass with less power water pressure and that could create, that will prevent the slope failures. And the higher the density of the canopy and leaf area, the greater the ability to catch rainfall. So if we have higher canopy, that higher density, so that will uh, catch the rainfall and that interception reduces the, reduces and delays the rainfalls to the soil surface. And also increase the shear stress transfer to the ground into the tensile resistance in the roots carries out the mechanical soil response by the roots. And also the tree's roots will increase the soil shear strength where the tensile strength is its own roots and provide slope shearing resistance during and after heavy rainfall. And then I will talk about the root traits. These are uh, improving soil mechanical properties. So one is the, when we have roots there, the density of roots crossing the shear plane is very important. And also the branch in density throughout the soil profile. The total length of the core, coarse roots in the shear plane. The shear plane is the assumed or the uh, probable shear failure plane. And also the total volume of the coarse roots and fine roots density below the shear plane. So those are very important when you are calculating uh, the strength. And then I will be talking few words about the site specific landslide risk assessment. There we have to understand the, all the elements at risk, maybe houses, buildings, infrastructure facilities, and also the topography of the area. And also the hydrology, that all natural and man-made elements and ecological features and soil formations and the socio-economic data related to population like to be exposed. Right. So those are the site-specific landslide risk assessment. And then we have to develop a site selection criteria uh, for the application of nature-based solutions. There we have to consider few uh, major aspects when you are developing this site selection criteria. One is called the depth to the failure plane. There when you take the depth to the failure plane, we have different ranges and then we have a marking scheme and also we have different weightages. And then we have the slope angle, depending on the different slope angle, we will consider the uh, the, we can give marks and also the weightage. And also then we will consider the uh, effect of this uh, uh, suitability of the uh, uh, nature-based application because of their soil thickness or it may be a rock or if the soil thickness is not enough that will create a problem. And also that we can see the sustainability and maintainability. If nobody is there to care of these things, right? So then it will not sustain. So to we, when we are introducing NBS, nature-based solutions, we, we, we want to check whether this can be, the, whether this is sustainable and there is somebody to maintain this. And also the, uh, the losses or the damages to this, right? So we have to see the real, real situation on this. Right? So considering all these aspects, we have developed a site selection criteria we have marks and also the weightages. And then with this, we develop this uh, final score. There we consider the number of criteria, weight assigned to each criteria, and the marks assigned to each criteria. With all these things, we can develop a scale from zero to four. If your scale is between three and four, it means you can simply introduce the nature-based landslide mitigation without any problem. If you are in the scale between two to three, it, you can go towards hybrid, and also it means you have the traditional uh, engineering measures with the nature-based solutions. If your score is less than two, it means definitely nature-based solutions will not work. You have to go for traditional engineering measures, but you can introduce uh, nature-based uh, mechanics, techniques, that is to control let's say erosion and to give some aesthetic appearance that can be used there in that situation. So this is the way that we uh, derived the, uh, the, the waste suitable sites. And then when you say the plant selection, 
that is also another uh, thing that we have to see how to select plants so we have some art architectural features or structure of a plant root system that play a significant role in shallow slope stabilization and erosion control and also ecological significance because in Sri Lanka we have different ecological zones so then we have to see particularly this uh, the plant will be compatible with this surrounding environment and also the native plant species because we we don't need to provide irrigation fertilizer or may demand less trimming and also we need to understand the mixture of compatible plant species over a single species because if you just introduce one single species because of the uh, plant succession that may not survive right so we have to think of a mixture of compatible plant species and also we have to understand the properties or structure above ground as well as the below ground both are very important not only the roots but also the uh, above ground the plants and the stems the uh, the, uh, the leaves and the stem and then if you just look at this uh, two maps one is our climate uh, zonation in this country the other one is the uh, landslide uh, ha hazard uh, uh, map right so that you can see those are exactly matching so they because the reason is landslide prone areas of Sri Lanka generally overlap with wet and intermediate zones because we have in our country those are la uh, rain induced land flights and in the wet zone the dominant vegetation is tropical evergreen forest with tall trees broad foliage and a dense undergrowth of wine, vines and creepers and in subtropical uh, evergreen forest resembling those of temperate climates and flourish in the higher altitudes and then we have uh, very high mountains they are they have montane vegetation at the highest altitudes tends to be uh, stunted and windswept and about the root soil matrix roots are strong in tension I have already told but the soils are strong in compression but very weak in tension because of this this combined effect of soil and roots results in the reinforced soil it is like reinforced concrete when shearing the soil roots mobilize their tensile strength whereby shear stresses that develop in the soil matrix are transferred to the root fibers via interface friction along the root length and to assess the increase in the soil shear strength we have to do some laboratory tensile test in situ shear test and some laboratory testing of root soil composites and also modeling the root soil interaction and then about the strength of plant roots in landslide prone areas so what we did was for each selected plant species approximately we collected 10 undamaged roots with an average diameter between 2 to 50 millimeter and we collected like 150 millimeter long root samples we collected them and then we we sometimes we have to do the dry excavation we collected in and uh, packed in uh, uh, in a manner that we will not lose the moisture and then we tested it in this uh, uh, dynamometer and then we check the tensile capacity right so these are some examples that we have done the photographs resemble these six, uh, the t t collection of uh, samples and also the testing and then we have to have a multi criteria framework to select suitable plants suitable species so we have to see the plant type and structural characteristics hydrological significance root strength uh, characteristics ecological significance and economic value because if you are introducing this in some areas they need some income as well and we develop the this uh, method considering three zones one is the toe the top of the uh, um, uh, slope the middle of the slope and also the toe area right because of depending on the root types we can introduce different plant species so in the middle of the uh, uh, slope that you see that we need a longer root types like vh types in the to top of the mountain or top of the slope that we don't need heavy plants if you introduce heavy plants that will cause more damage but in the 
bottom or the toe of the slope that we have to introduce heavy, strong plants that will resist the slope movement, right? So that we have to understand these concepts, the considering the root types. And then I will uh, take few examples. I am acknowledging here Dr. Anruddha Karunaratna for helping us in this work. As, uh, at the beginning also I told that this is a multidisciplinary research that we got their help. So this is a selected grass type. So this is lemongrass. So there we collected all the information like how it grows, where it grows, what are the soil types, what are the climatic conditions, how, what is their root type, how it behaves. All these things were collected into a small format like this. So this is for lemongrass and this is for coffee. So this is a small tree. The previous one is grass. This is a small tree, the shrub. So then we can see their features where we can introduce because depending on the length of the roots so or the, the, the weight of the tree that we can uh, select the exact place where to plant that one. And this is the medium sized tree. Uh, this is Gandumer. And they are, those are medium sized trees that those are not so heavy, also not so small. And this is a large one. This is uh, the uh, Guinea Sapu, right? So they, these, these are very, very large trees, right? So they are grown large and they, we know they are root types. We know they are features like where, where they are growing, what are the conditions actually they need and what are the benefits actually the people are getting from this type of trees. We collected all this information. It's a uh, group work, right? So I, I, that's why I acknowledge Dr. Anurudha Karunaratna. And I am moving to the geotechnical assessment. In this geotechnical assessment, now we, are, we have collected all these informations and now we need the materials in all, uh, for this assessment. We need the material properties, cohesion, and the internal friction, and the fracture density, and the quality of that available uh, material, degree of weathering of the material, geometry, the surface, the slope angle, weight and the load distribution, water content in the, and the phreatic surface. Type of vegetation now we are going to introduce and also external forces like if you have any rainfall, earthquakes, whatever other forces must be connected. And in this one, we can see the root reinforce effect. When the soil is moving, the root takes some uh, tension, right? So when it increases the shear strength, the anchoring effect is larger, but there is a limit after that that is lost. So that will start the failure, right? The other figure that you can see that when you have unreinforced soil, there is no cohesion. That apparent cohesion is not there. So when you have a reinforced one, we have an apparent cohesion. That is an advantage, right? So we have two things that we can consider here. One is this additional tension, uh, tensile force that can be converted as an apparent cohesion. And you can see this schematic diagram of a progressive failure. There you can see bef just before the failure and when it is moving, what will happen to the root system. Those are gradually failing. But if, if there is no tree, there is no benefit like this, it will just move. And also, you can see the other one, the, because of the type of the roots, that the shear resistance will be different. So we have to understand the type of roots and then we know the shear resistance as well. We can understand the shear resistance. So these facts indicate that the spatial distribution of roots would contribute to soil reinforcing more than all the other factors. And also we have to model the hydrological effect. The root water uptake of trees increases the metric suction of adjacent soils due to the reduction in the moisture content, which therefore makes the, uh, the tree soil metric unsaturated. This unsaturated soil are stronger than a saturated case. Saturated s soils will in give high uh, pressure or the soil pore water pressure is there, so that will create the, uh, the damage. And also we have to consider the humidity, temperature, wind speed and the soil moisture conditions and the tree physiology, that those are the environmental factors that will affect the transpiration of the trees. And I will take you to some case studies. 
So one is this Badulu Sirigama. Badulu Sirigama case is very, very next to the Uva Vellasa University. You can see the Uva Vellasa University, the buildings are there, right? So the, the, the down of the slope that you can see the village, Badulu Sirigama. So we identified that this has been already moved and then we did three analyses. One is slope without any mitigation measures. So what, what is the situation without any modification and the Jap with the Japanese aids that they introduce subsurface drains. So then what is the impact by introducing the subsurface drainage and then what will happen if you introduce vegetation on top of this? So it is a hybrid solution. So what will be the end result? And then stability assessment without any mitigative measure, that is the case study, then we have these properties of soils. And then, as you know, some of you can remember the factor of safety, how safe we are, right? If it is just one or less than one, it is not safe. So this is the situation before introducing any mitigative measures. I would like to acknowledge here one of our master students from NBRO, Lilanka Kankanamge, and also one partner we had from ADPC, Chintaka Ganepola for helping us in this analysis. And then we had this uh, stability assessment with engineering measures or horizontal drains. There we increased the, we, we were able to increase the factor of safety just beyond 1, 1.18 or nearly 1.2. And then we introduced the vegetation. So if, when we introduce the vegetation to this, we introduce a colluvium with vegetation, one layer. And with this layer, we had different properties. And with this, if you just look at this one, the factor of safety increases. Factor of safety increases like 1.4, 1.6, like that. So we had a situation where without any improvement, factor of safety was less than one or nearly one. And then the, when, when we introduced the drainage improvement, factor of safety was uh, more than one, it is safe. And then when we, we, if we can introduce vegetation, definitely we can improve the factor of safety of the slope. And then we gave a solution to this because it should be uh, beneficial for everybody so that we gave a grassland at the top of the land, then the, the people can use it for their cows. And the middle that we um, suggested the botanical garden to the Uwe Vellasa University so they can use for their studies because Uwe Vellasa University has different programs. And then the, the low, low one that we have a community program so they can introduce different plants that those are suitable for their income. Right? So this is the one that we introduced for Badulu Sirigam. Similarly, we introduced this concept for some other case studies. One is this Sri Sumangala school in Matale. They, are, they, had, uh, they had some failures in their playground. So there we introduced this vegetation, veg vegetated gabions as a, uh, as a method that is blending with the environment, right? You can see in the picture, this is full green area, right? So we, we, without just introducing pure gabion, we introduced the vegetated gabion into this area. And then Haggala area, there were a few uh, slides uh, next to this park. So there we introduce, uh, we introduce a few plants, those are uh, good against landslides. They can uh, grow in this mi micro environment and also they are uh, helping uh, to uh, maintain the moisture. And then we had uh, this Ayagama case study. There, there was a uh, landslide in Ayagama and they are the, the standard uh, design was to introduce uh, traditional engineering measures. We wanted to introduce a leisure park by introducing the plants that we have studies in this area. And that leisure park is a kind of a, uh, advantage for the people that they can just go there and uh, stay some time because they don't have such a place in Nayagama. And then the challenges that we have in this kind of NBS applications or nature-based applications in Sri Lanka for landslide risk management. One is the landslide risk mitigation. When you have the designers, they lack confidence in the use of vegetation for slope stabilization. That is the major problem that we have seen. We, sometimes we could not convince the designers. The lack of knowledge about soil bioengineering and landscaping measures to stabilize 
unstable soaps that, that limits the designers in applying such solutions in landslide countermeasures. And also there is a very limited interest in allocating more research for these type of studies, research, and capacity building. So of course we know there are capacity gaps, but that we have to study this and then improve this situation. And in my concluding remarks, it's a very simple concluding remark that I want to mention. That is, we all must embrace the nature conservation measures and norms and practices. The nature-based solutions can be done alone or as combined or as hybrid. This must be site-specific. We can't just put one solution to another place. We have to study the case. This is site-specific. And whatever we do, it should benefit to everybody, right? Not only the, uh, the people who design, that people who are living, the nature, the environment. And also, this must be an integral part of the policies and the actions. That, that is the must, right? That is very important. And whatever we do, this must be sustainable and futuristic. I quote from UNEP, when we protect nature, nature protects us. The opportunities for further research studies, so further studies with NBS, that is, I highlight this key word, the multidisciplinary research. We have to, we have a lot of opportunities for multidisciplinary research. And also, we have to model the evapotranspiration that we could not do in our studies that I have already uh, we have sent a proposal to SRC with Dr. Mudita Pallevat and Professor Ranjit Tamarasinghe from Mechanical Department. And also we need to do instrumentation in real scale projects and see actually what is happening here. And long term observations because the, the vegetation cannot grow in short time, right? So sometimes it takes five years, so seven years. So we need long term observations and we need to apply for different ecological zones. We cannot just do it for one zone and do, apply the same in another one. And we have to see the behavior of roots in a given climate, given different environment condition. The water table will be different. Uh, the moisture content will be different. I learned those things from my colleagues uh, when we are doing this, right? If the water table is well below, roots go up to that level and make that stronger, right? If the water table is very shallow, roots will not grow that strong. So those are the things that we have to learn. And also, we have to maintain plant nurseries. If you are going for this, if you are doing it really, we need to maintain plant nurseries. Otherwise, we can't just do this. And we have to update the plant manuals we have made. We have to introduce new plant types. There may be good or better plants than what we have selected. So we have to always have a dynamic system that we have to upgrade these plant manuals. And the publications that I have had on these landslides and nature-based studies, I have to thank all these research students, partners from ADPC, NBRO, all they helped to do this work. And then this, I would like to acknowledge my parents, my mother and the late father, I know he's looking at me from heaven. Uh, and then my wife and the kids, they are always helping me, kind of a support that I never get, right? So they always uh, give me this help, right? So sometimes I was away for these field visits for a few days, they never complain. Right? Thank you very much, wife, Manjula, and kids, Yenuli, Senut, and Dinut. And also, two, two sisters and my relatives, they have been always with me for the last 48 years. Right? So they were the strength to me. Right, so uh, I appreciate their help. And also, I would like to acknowledge the teachers who taught me from grade one to 13. For, uh, I studied uh, my primary education in Smalabi Rahula Vidyal, and now it became a girls' school, but at that time it was a mixed school. And then I got through in this grade five scholarship and went to Ananda College. And then completed my studies at Ananda and then came to Moratua and did four years at Moratua, and then masters at AIT and PhD at Yokohama. I, I must thank all these teachers. So they gave me this courage and the confidence. And also I would like to thank my supervisors, Professor Atula Kulatilaka at Moratua University, who was my first supervisor in the undergraduate research, 
final year project. And Professor Bala is Bala Subramaniam from AIT, and then Professor Jiro Takemura from AIT, and late Professor Goro Imai. So he was my PhD professor, and I was his last PhD student. And Professor George Hornberger from Vanderbilt University, and then distinguished Professor Buddhima Indratna from Wollongo University. I appreciate all their help during my studies. And then my research students at Ruhuna. I was there. I was at Ruhuna for seven years before I joined in Moratua. So there I had several research students. And also the students from Moratua. And also my research partners, ADPC and NBRO. And also the friends at my soil lab at Moratua, they were always helping me in my endeavors. Right. And also, I would like to thank the World Bank for funding this one, NBRO and ADPC for helping me in this project. And also, ISL slash Sri Lanka Geotechnical Society, everyone is acknowledged here. And finally, I would like to thank my friends in my Moratua Civil Engineering Batch. I know they are listening here. And also friends from Ananda College, they are also here. I know some of them, I saw them. Right. Thank you, friends. And of course, the friends from Mal Malabi, my hometown, my friends from my childhood. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That uh, now you have been introduced to the public. And hopefully, uh, after getting the crowds, uh, we had a lot of participation. Uh, one can turn and say from Hong Kong, that we, we said as Hong Kong was the kind of like the uh, where you can learn from, but let's hope that you can look towards the Sri Lanka and University of Moratua, and here we have the resources. Uh, thank you. That's a very small item to, just to conclude that we have uh, spent our time, and may I invite um, Professor Nalin, Dean Faculty of Engineering, to hold, uh, give the small token of appreciation to the, the our speaker. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes uh, today's and the first inaugural uh, lecture presentation. And uh, now we have a task at FGS. This is a monthly event. So, every month on a third week, Thursday, or the fourth week, we will have this evening session, one hour, on this sharing of or introducing our professors to the public and looking at what we are doing and what we are capable of doing from University of Moratua. Thank you very much and have a good day.